that number is garbage. And you know, there's another company in Indianapolis. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. I, that's the thing, Clay. That's why I'm not understanding what you're doing. You're telling me here, bro, because like he's on the record saying one thing. I have no evidence to uh, prove that what he said is incorrect. You are apparently the only guy that has some type of evidence that proves that, but you don't want to talk about it. So I don't even want you to do. If you're a documentary, if you're a documentary filmmaker, you go find it. I mean, this is what a journalist does. Are you a journalist, or what? I mean, what are you? Well, I'm not your fucking. I'm not your errand boy. I haven't found anything, and you're telling me I gotta go find it. I'm not your errand boy. That's not how this works. Instead of hanging out bigger pockets, why don't you actually go meet with Jack Schechter and Jack Gibson in fucking Indianapolis who ran high return real estate? They were there in the city. They have hundreds of properties from Ocean Point. The exact same thing happened to them. They then had to move all of their properties over to Urban House, other property management companies who literally had hundreds of people. We, we've moved our properties over to Urban House. So like, oh my God, we had hundreds from high return real estate that worked with Ocean Point, got totally fucked by Ocean Point. And their clients were in a shitstorm, way, way worse. And mm-hmm. Urban House got flooded with properties from high return real estate. Now, when you first did your, uh, you know, your first few deals with Burt Whalen, how did... Uh everything transpire were these deals smooth were they easy going or were there red flags right from the start no everything from the very beginning was to me felt very much on the up and up i got a great vibe from bird we did um i mean i even stayed at his guest room and his his house multiple times I, i never in the beginning i never really felt like there was any red flags my instincts weren't like on high alert at all I mean, the business model made sense. Everything he told me made sense. It seemed like a pretty straightforward operation. You buy a property at a discount that needs rehab. You'd send a construction team in, rehab the property, place a tenant, and send the investor a check for purchasing the property. So at that point, what was uh, the relationship like with you and Bert? Like specifically... What was your involvement in these deals? Were you just buying them yourself and he was handling the asset for you on the ground? Were you selling them to other folks? Where were you guys at right then and there? So when I first started, I was I was not looking to do real estate. I have a very, very successful multi-million dollar nutrition distribution um, operation. I was looking for a safe place to or so I thought, right? To place my <laughs> to place my um, my capital. And I had looked around at other markets and prices were pretty high and the returns and it didn't really make sense for the amount of risk. So looking at Indianapolis, uh, the city was three hours from my house. It made sense. So I just started buying up as a turnkey buyer. Um, I I bought up to, I was up to 15 units with Bert, all, all properties that I bought through him and things were going great. I mean, I'm getting incredible returns on my, that first batch based on the price to rent ratios. Um, he, he had them 14 out of 15 were leased and performing for the first uh, 12 months. So I got excited. I mean, when I believe in something, I feel pretty strong about my ability to sell it. So I started, you know, referring other investors left and right from my you know network of trusted, you know, people over the last 20 years that I've built up you know, that trust equity with them, right? So when I told him that it was working, it was good. He's a good stand-up guy. You know, they moved. And so I sold $5 in, you know, just in cash real estate, just through referrals. And at first, Bert would just give me a a discount off my rehabs. And then, you know, as I started scaling more and more, it just didn't make sense. It made sense to, you know, pay me out of commission. So he would start to uh, send me wires and, I was getting more excited and that's about the time where I realized I needed to bring in a a partner to help me to scale the company. I could only do so much myself. I knew that we needed to do some digital marketing. We needed to create a nice website presence, a podcast, a brand, and I just didn't have the bandwidth to do it myself. So that's when I brought in and recruited Shecky here to be my 50-50 equity partner in high return real estate. So when Shecky came in, you know, we were very, very, still very much, um, you know, working with Bert at that time. Originally, we thought we were just going to have a sales and marketing company. 
and we were just going to promote Ocean Point stuff because when I, I I wasn't from Indianapolis, but when I flew up here and met all the parties, like Jack said, everything seemed like it was all on the up and up. And you know, we started with them, you know, basically as far as doing everything, you know, the acquisitions and the rehabs and the property management. But um, it did not take very long for the wheels to fall off at that point. We just started seeing some real uh, significant problems just in terms of any relationship with any supplier and uh, really, really lacking in communication and really having a good idea of where our investors were at with their performance. That was kind of the first big red flag that we noticed is we just weren't getting answers on anything. And we had a lot of investors reaching out to us saying that they, you know, couldn't get in touch with the property management teams. And, uh, you know, we were very much sucked into quite a bit of additional customer service that we were not planning on. What was like that time frame? Was it like uh, everything was smooth for like the first year and then the following six months it got rocky? Can you kind of walk me through like, you know, what started to happen, how many units were sold and, and like what ultimately led you uh, to make that decision to, to cut ties with Wayland? Yeah, for me, from the time that I started buying, which would have been January of 2016, um, it wasn't until the following like August of 2017 that I really started like just really seeing some things that, that I really didn't like. So Shecky and I had only been together maybe what, a few months? Yeah. yeah. Would you be able to give me an example of some of those things you saw that you didn't like? Like, what did you see? What were the flags? Well, I'd have investors. The, the main, the biggest thing is what Shecky kind of alluded to there. You know, lots of investors that I, you know, brought in, they're coming back and hitting me up and being like, I can't get a hold of anybody at Ocean Point. I, you know, I've got all these liens that I'm getting against my property and, and I'm getting no answers on. There's, you know, the, the, stacks and stacks of city code violations are starting to kind of pile up on a lot of their properties. And, you know, I'm not getting any answers about, you know, leases. You know, one time I went into the leasing office to try to make sense of what's going on, like what's leased up, what's not, how do we get these performing? And that's right when I realized like that something's very, very wrong here. And, I, I I just don't want to be a part of this. This just doesn't, it's not, it's just not adding up. So, you know, that's when Shecky and I had a conversation and, you know, look, I'm a very loyal guy and probably to a fault. And Shecky's like, cause I didn't really want to, you know, this was, it wasn't bad enough. Right. I didn't know of any fraud. I just knew it. I just felt it was disorganized and chaotic. And Shecky's like, look, dude, you're so loyal, but like we've got to sever ties with these guys. So it was, it was a good push from Shecky to say, Hey, you know, this, this is not, this is not working out. And then it wasn't until March of 2018 that we really had a full understanding of just how bad the whole situation was. Yeah. So specific examples, just so you, people kind of have a picture of what happened. So one of them, my investor, Lisa, I've known her for 20 years. She's very important to me. And, you know, I, as far as how, how important, I mean, she's, she's produced millions of dollars of sales revenue in my other company, right? So I brought her in as an investor. She purchased a quadruplex on Grand Avenue in Indy and she paid 85,000 for it. And it was supposed to have about a $40,000 rehab. So the property, um, when the, everything kind of collapsed in March, when the email went out, um, Lisa had been getting, Three units of rent. She'd what, been getting Jack, real quick, what email specifically are you referring to in March? I just want to make sure we have that clarified. Uh, so an email went out to 250 Ocean Point investors stating that the property management of Ocean Point had been is dissolved per se. Okay. And that basically that when that email went out, the property management had changed to a different property manager. I believe it was because Bert, uh, his license had been revoked or something along those, those lines where he couldn't actually, he wasn't operating under his own license. He had been operating under somebody else's license the whole time. So that um, the, the gentleman that he was operating under 
figured out that things weren't on the up and up. So he said, my name's on the line here. I'm taking over all these properties. So that's the short of that. When that happened um, and the email went out, I started getting pinged from all my referral investors saying, I want to sell, buy this back from me. I want out. My rents just went down by 60, 70, 80% in some cases where they're getting Lisa, who is getting $1,500 a month in rent, or there's actually 700, 1700, her rent, her rent check went to zero. Okay. okay hold on. Let, let me just <clears throat> make sure I, I got this. So you're saying, Prior to that email going out and the change happening, you've got a bunch of investors out there that their properties are, are producing relatively consistently and the returns are pretty stable, mm -hmm. but then the property management changes and then the performance just immediately, like with the flip of a switch changed? Absolutely. Flip of a switch. Every single investor that I had, their rent statement dropped by big, big percentages. How many investors would you say that was roughly? 30. 30 investors accounting for the, I think you said it earlier, roughly 100 or so units? Yes, 130 yeah. units. So between my 15 and then other properties that Sheck and I had purchased from Ocean Point to rehab and um, to turn to our investor, you know, new investor purchases network, um, and then all the people that I had already sold to, it was roughly 130 units. What would you infer attributed to that immediate drop in performance? Was the new property management company not a good management company? Or do you have any inclination of why the drop occurred? Well, you know, there's, there's only really one thing that makes sense. You know, I don't have any proof per se of that it actually transpired this way. But, uh, you know, there was tenants where we, once we kind of went in and took the properties over from that property manager that had taken over for Ocean Point. You know, we discovered mostly vacant units, dilapidated units, um, most, uh, squatters, um, leases that were for three, four hundred dollars a month. And the rent that had been paid out was six, seven hundred dollars per month to the investor. So nothing, it just nothing made sense. Why are investors getting money every single month like clockwork on a C-class property where, and no maintenance is ever being charged to them. They're just getting perfect straight rent every single month. But then we find out that the, all the units are vacant, squatting. It didn't make sense. Yeah. And that, that would probably not uh, <clears throat> occur in the normal you know, operation of a rental property. Obviously we have ebbs and flows and we do get vacancies, but yeah, it doesn't typically happen in a wave like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you guys actually got some physical eyes on these properties, which like you could typically as an investor tell uh, if a unit was just lived in and the tenant just moved out like a day or two ago versus like a, a unit that had been vacant for a considerable amount of time. Was that mm -hmm. your experience? You're looking at units that appear to have been vacant for a considerable amount of time, not just when that switch occurred? We had, there was quite a bit of a mix. There was, you know, there was, there were some that had squatters living in them that were, you know, that could not produce any lease or um, couldn't verify or show that they, any records that they had been paying rent at all. Um, there were, there were certain properties that looked like they had just recently vacated. There was a mix that, it's like nobody had ever lived there for a year. There were properties where, like the, the property I'm alluding to on Grand, the water had never even been turned on for the last, it had been turned on for years. But so, yet there was an investor who was receiving rental income checks for that property the entire time. Absolutely. We had lots of instances where water had not had ever been turned on on the property for the time period that the investor had been receiving rent checks. What did you guys, what actions did you guys take uh, to handle those investors' needs and mitigate their losses uh, after you decide it's time to cut, cut ties with Waylon? Well, that's a, that's a long answer, James. I mean, it's, um, <clears throat> there was a number of things that happened. Obviously there were many investors that had already reached out to us and we were already in conversation with them. For the ones that hadn't, we reached out to them. We obviously need, needed an immediate property management solution. 
and we were able to partner up with a very nice gentleman that ran a, a locally owned company here that you know kind of helped us through that tougher situation on the management side and there was a lot to work through so just to clarify Shecky yeah. originally it was Ocean Point handling the PM and right. Even though some of these properties did not have water on, the money was coming in monthly. Correct. But then Ocean Point, because of Wayland's license status with the state of Indiana, all Ocean Point property management as a brokerage ceased to exist. They kicked it over to one company. Mm -hmm. That's when your personal property and all of your 30 some odd investors performance immediately dipped and you two have now been made aware of the situation you're in. At that point, you two yourselves took your group of investors and moved to a complete new management company, a third management company. Correct. So yep. now, okay, so now you guys have completely severed all ties with everything that has occurred thus far, and you guys are essentially starting fresh. Correct. Well, yeah, I wouldn't be use the word fresh, but yeah, we're, <laughs> we're starting over. Um, and obviously it was pretty hellacious just trying to get stuff moved over to that property management company because even, even the change from Burke to whoever uh, the other entity was, they were, it was the same thing. They were just uncooperative and non-communicative. So there was very much a lot of things that we had to just figure out for ourselves and some of it was guesswork and things like that. But yeah, we had to go into every single property and assess what was going on and come up with some recommendations. You know, some properties obviously were in really, really piss poor condition. Some were not so bad. Uh, there were many investors that just said, you know, screw it, I just want to sell. And, you know, for those, we tried to help them sell them off, you know, through a number of methods, whether it's, you know, listing them on the MLS or some of them we... Uh, partnered with them on getting them fixed up and, you know, reselling them through our own investor network or other potential networks. And uh, that worked out fairly well. I mean, we bore, as Jack said, much of the financial burden for doing this kind of stuff because we felt um, an obligation to those investors. There were some extreme situations where we actually bought the property back. And we just started fresh and started with a brand new rehab and brand new processes and eventually turned it into a nice property and got it tenanted and sold it as a turnkey company to a completely new investor with, you know, fresh energy, no history, any of that kind of stuff. So there were, there were a number of those, but you know, we're like we're now two years later and we're still feeling the effects of it. We, like I said earlier, we've only got maybe half a dozen or so properties left like this that are, still feeling the effect of the previous, you know, mistakes that we made from that association. But we just did whatever was necessary. Sometimes it was just fixing it up. Sometimes it was selling it off. Sometimes it was buying it back. Sometimes it was a mixture, you know, it just whatever needed to happen. We just did it. And there were the, thankfully the investors we had good relationship with and some of them understood that we could not do this all at once. One of the things that we felt really bad about was that, some of these people had to wait a year before we could even touch their property. Mm -hmm. And that was the situation with a lot of other investors that bought through networks outside of ours, but were still affected by that too, because you got to understand there were so many, when this email hit, this affected not just our investors, but hundreds, hundreds of investors that had been exposed to this problem in the Indianapolis market. And there forget about finding a good contractor. You couldn't even find a contractor. They were all just so ridiculously busy. And then what's sad is there became this whole, uh, you know, sort of separate market, almost like a black market to quote unquote, take care of these investors that had been affected by that. And, you know, many of them sold off at huge losses. Like there were, you know, wholesalers playing vulture. And I mean, it was not a pretty situation. Mm -hmm. And um, so we saw a lot of that going on and just said, okay, let's at least alert, alert our investors to this situation so they're not sucked in by the black marketeers. 
And even if they've got to wait a year, let's at least come up with some sort of solution where they're not going to have this extreme amount of damage as if they were just being poached. So, you know, we just did whatever we could. Yeah, so James, I'd like to give a couple of uh, specific advan- uh, examples of properties where we, you know, stepped in and, and really saved uh, some some investor, you know, losses, substantial uh, leases property on uh, Grand, one of my dear friends, long time, 20 years in business together and my other company, you know, she, she bought a quad for 85 grand, it was going to get 40 in rehab and the uh, when when everything the shit hit the fan in March, her rent went from seventeen hundred down to zero. Okay, so the property turned out there was very little rehab that had ever been done to it. If she would have sold it on the open market, she would have been lucky to get twenty grand back out. Um, maybe on a really really good day, thirty thousand, but I really have my doubts. So we went in and I put in my own money. I rehabbed it, put 50 grand back into the property of my own money. And then we ended up selling it for 115,000, fully performing with all four real tenants paying. And uh, Lisa got paid back out at closing um, $80,000. So she was made whole between her, what she got back and then the rent she had uh, received. And I, pocketed the other, you know, what is 35,000. So I ended up taking a $15,000 hit on that. And then after we sold it, it turned out we needed additional work. Um, So I put another 15 grand back into the property to keep to for the new investor to take care of them. So, you know, I told Lisa the other day, I'm like, you realize I lost 30 grand on your property to get your money back out. And we sold it commission free, and she's like, "Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna start selling some more product. I'll make, you know, I'll make the money back for you." So <laughs> I'm like, "Okay, get to work." <laughs> and then another um, friend of mine, Ed, he had a property on 18th Street. It was two single families on one lot. He bought it for fifty five thousand. He got rent for about six months, and then uh, the rent check stopped. And um, turned out it had some major, uh, major structural foundation issues. They both, both houses needed new roofs. I mean, it, they were disasters. So um, that is one of our final properties that need to be still are finishing up rehab. It's scheduled to get done by the end of next week. And I put uh, 45000 so far of my own money back into his property because he didn't have the funds to fix it back up. We've got it under contract for a hundred. So I'm going to get, you know, maybe 40,000 of Ed's 55 back. Look, there's some situations like Shecky said, it's like almost impossible despite our best efforts to get an investor like 100% whole. Um, some situations that worked out like with Lisa and, and I took a big hit, you know, other situations it's like we, we just had to draw the line and say, this is, this is the best that we can do for you. And we're still, we're still stepping up to the plate to mitigate your losses. So, uh, you know, thank, thankfully, like people like investors like Ed are very patient. You know, he's just been the last year, he's been like, hey, man, I get it. It's not your fault. When you can get to it, get to it. I know you'll take care of me. So that's, that's how we've had. And then we've had other investors, you know, that, um, to be honest, James, like there's there's two or three that are not fans of, you know, Jack Gibson <laughs> that uh, I sold property to. But those were ones where, you know, they had, you know, one of them had 15 units that all needed 30, 40,000 of work on each property. What was the total financial loss on your company in relation to all this? Like how much did you guys have to actually put in? It's really hard to put a, a firm number on it. Um, our company lost 275000 last year alone. Um, not all of that can be attributed to the Ocean Point. We also had another, um, you know, a rehab team that, uh, you know, didn't follow through with, with what we paid them to do. So by and large, though, it was, um, you know, it was definitely a, a, a probably in the tune of four or $500,000 or more. This was a really tough struggle for a younger company. I mean, we, we were selling other properties all along, and obviously we needed to to be able to stay afloat. But there, there were many situations because of the money that we had put into previous investors' property, we were having a hard time making payroll. I mean, it was, 
there, there was more than once that it was touch and go and we were in danger of going out of business. Has Burt Whalen ever attempted in any way to mitigate the losses that you and your investors suffered during this whole process? Not one time. Not once. Never reached out. Never said, uh, there was never a text, not one correspondence sent at any time that would have said, hey, what can I do to help? What can I do to mitigate this? I mean, it was, it was like we were the enemy to him. Thank, thank God I had another business that had, was already established and built. I had to rob that business of its, a lot of its monthly revenue and pull that over into high return real estate just to keep the company, you know, payroll going, keep our marketing going and, and to keep this thing alive. So, you know, it was, a, as Shecky said, a, I think for any company to go through it established or otherwise would have been rough, but to, to be one year in and you're just getting the ball, you know, you're just getting your roots established and getting a, trying to get your name out there and you have to, not only try to focus on generating new business so you can stay afloat, but you're dealing with this every single day from the moment you wake up till you go to bed. <clears throat> it was um, to say that, that it was a struggle would be quite an understatement. The question I have for you now is, do you guys think that, you know, how you handled it after the shit hit the fan versus how Clayton Morris and his company Morris Invest have handled a similar situation, albeit on a much larger scale. Do you guys, what are some of the big differences in how um, each camp proceeded forward when it hit the fan? <laughs> uh, it's a tough question. I mean, I don't, I don't really want to point fingers. I mean, look, we, we had a, what was it, Jack, 100, 130 doors probably that were affected. Yeah. And it's taken us two years pretty much to work through that. Um, Clayton was operating on a much bigger scale. And so to be able to do what we did for our investors, whether the desire was there or not, was probably impossible for him just because of the numbers that he was doing. And, you know, I, like I said, we, I can't make any ethical judgments about what anybody else is doing. Uh, we just know what we, we felt that we had to do. One thing that is very different about how we approach the situation on the onboarding process is that when we marketed and sold a property that was in Ocean Point Rehab and Ocean Point Management, I mean, we never made any claims or made any sort of reference that said that this is our team. There was a, always a very clear separation. We said this, yes, our company is high return real estate, but this is a sales and marketing entity and we are selling an Ocean Point product. So we never, we never said, yeah, this, this whole operation is ours. The rehab teams is ours. We never misrepresented to our investor base that, that we're in charge of the whole thing. So when the, you know, when the shit did hit the fan, you know, our investors were also very clear and understanding of the fact that, yes, we sold them the property. Yes, we recommended them to them, but we didn't do the rehab. So we didn't do the property management. We didn't send out, you know, the, uh, the rent checks, <laughs> rent checks, right? We didn't do any of that. So we were in a much better position with our investors to really lay out, like, here's what happened. And here's what we're going to do to try to help you. Now, as Shecky said, there were a lot of different, uh, things that uh, we did to try to sell our properties. But one thing we were, that I was very uh, clear on with my investor base is don't make a rash decision right now when there's, you're competing to try to sell your property with so many hundreds of other people that are trying to do it right now. You're going to take monster losses. So I just kind of held try to keep them all patient, even though a lot of them are texting me, you know, for answers, you know, some, some daily, some were very patient and once a month type updates, but I just try to get them patient, patient, patient. It's we're much better to be patient and wait for this storm to kind of pass and then try to fix these properties back up versus just dumping them for an extreme loss. And I believe with that strategy of just patience and even though it was the harder way to go, 
we preserved a lot of investor capital in 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 it really saved a lot of people from from some monumental losses and even helped some people to honestly make a profit believe it or not on their ocean point properties which uh, was pretty pretty difficult to accomplish it's a it's a tough situation and i could i could tell uh <clears throat> that uh you know, it was tough on you guys as a big blow uh, to what you're trying to do as business owners. Um, what would you say, uh, have you guys learned from this? And like, what, what, what does high return real estate look like today as I talk to you two uh, versus what it looked like back then? Like, what are, you guys, are you guys doing things differently than you were doing back then before this whole thing happened? <laughs> kind of the polar opposite of those days. So, you know, Jack and I often joke, we have a podcast too, and we often joke that, you know, had we known what we were getting into, we probably would have never done this. Definitely would have never done it. <laughs> but, you know, here we are, and and the, the lessons were extremely expensive, but very, very valuable. So to answer your question, for example, you know, we, we obviously saw there's really two sides of problems. One is the problem with the rehab, and the other is the problem with the management. So we know we're pretty good at acquisitions. We know the market pretty well. So how could we dial in good rehabs? And now, of course, over the years, we've developed relationships with really fantastic crews, and we've got some people that work exclusively for us, and it's really great. But we actually do two rehab or two um, inspections on a property. So we, when we go and acquire a property, the first thing we do is we turn on utilities, and we then go right from there into an inspection of the property so that when our teams go in and rehab, they have their own checklist of things that they're going to look at. We, you know, obviously, we check out everything on the property, but they also have the advantage of a third-party inspection to work with as they're going through, so we, we very, very rarely see any surprises. When they get to the end of the rehab, we actually call for another third-party inspection, and we ask that it's not the same person. So we're, we're not looking for a review of the first inspection. We're looking for a fresh set of eyes just for quality control. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's nothing that comes out perfect. You know, second inspector might find a couple other things. If there's anything that's still outstanding on that inspection report that's meaningful to a good rehab, we will send our crews back in to fix those minor little items, you know, take a picture, sign off on it, make sure everything is okay. Can I bring in my own inspector and have them look at it too? As yeah, a yeah, it's a great question. And the, the answer is yes. Um, what's interesting is because of the double inspections that we already do, we get very, very few investors that request that. But for the odd investor, which is a small percentage of them that do, that say, hey, I still want to get another set of eyes on it, by all means. You're, you're buying the property. You want to spend the money on an additional um, inspection. Uh, we have not yet seen that prove out any new information, but they're more than welcome to do that. We definitely direct them to, to if they want to purchase a property and get an additional inspection, get one that's already, that's still vacant because, you know, it really, it's quite a challenge for us once a tenant is placed and now tenants been in there a week or two and now you're already disrupting them with another person coming in and scrutinizing the property. So we prefer those from our side to smooth line, streamline everything, you know, that they do it on a vacant property. But uh, look, yeah, we, we're not ever going to tell an investor, you know, you can't order another one. If they feel they don't, uh, they need more verification, then no problem. We get it. We're going to look back on this a few years from now being like, that was a great thing that happened to us because we learned this, 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 and this, we got stronger. And now we have this amazing company that we can, you know, we can pass on, you know, to our heirs and we can be proud of the name high return real estate. And when that day comes, I mean, look, it's, it's going to be pretty special. But in the meantime, all we really want to do is get the last set of properties off the books done. We have sold everybody squared away. And then Shecky and I are going to, we're going to throw a big party. It's called the debertification party. <laughs> That's our goal. We can't wait to have this party. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.